Hello and welcome to Encompass Live. We had a little bit of technical difficulties this morning and we're trying to get a couple of things fixed. But in the meantime, we thought we'd get started. We have um, a very interesting program today from Norfolk, Nebraska, and that is um, Jessica Chamberlain, the director, and two of her staff members. I'll let you introduce yourselves. And they're going to talk about Wi-Fi hotspots that they loan out to their patrons. So we're really looking forward to that. And I am now going to click on the the spot here and make Jessica a presenter. There we go. So now, in just a minute, we should hear Jessica. Go ahead, Jessica, when you're ready. Okay, you can see our screen and everything there? You're a little, I can barely hear you. Okay. Is this better? That's better, yes, thank you. Okay. So, as Sally said, um, we're from the Norfolk Public Library in Norfolk, Nebraska. Um, I'm the director, and uh, we have Judy Hilkeman and Mike Dittmer here with us today as well. We're going to talk about some different aspects of the um, loaning the hotspots. But we're going to start with really backing up a little bit before we talk about how to do it, is really why you would want to do this or why you may want to think about doing it. You know, one thing that is kind of inspired us. We heard about bigger cities that did this. Um, you know, New York and Chicago have been doing this for a couple of years, and it really piqued our interest. We thought it was something that could really be applicable in our community, but we didn't really know how to get started or, or what to do. Um, so it kind of was on our long-term dreams list of things that would be great to do. Um, but then we were contacted uh, several months ago by a representative from Verizon who offered um, a program that we could just opt into and start, and that really made it seem a lot more doable. So once it seemed like a possibility, then we really needed to look and see if this was something seriously that we should consider. And I know this is a super boring slide, um, but really this just goes to show that I mean, it sounds a little flashy and exciting to be circulating hotspots, but it's really no different than any other program or service that we consider doing. I would even say that because it's a little bit flashy, you really need to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and that you have well thought out information to give the public about why you're doing it. Innovation draws attention, and you want to make sure that you're focusing and directing that attention in a positive way um, to make sure that you can really say, we're doing this because this meets the needs of the community. So the first step in that process is really, is there a need, and how do you find out if there's a need? Um, you know, before we even look at this chart, I think we have to start with that premise that everyone understands the internet is no longer a luxury. Um, if your community already understands that and knows that internet access is a need, then, um, then you're ready to go on to the next step. But if you are in a community that thinks that high-speed internet access is still a luxury and not really necessary in today's society, then you have some groundwork to lay first. Um, but that's a broader topic than we have time for today. So, um, uh, so anyway, um, so how do you determine if there is a need in your community? Uh, one resource you can use for our Nebraska participants, anyway, is the state broadband study. There's a link there on the slide, um, and that chart you see is an excerpt from that study. It shows the percentage of households with broadband internet at home. And you can see that in most regions across the state, and our state average is um, improving from 2010 to 2014. Um, but we're at the northeast region of the state, all the way down at the bottom of that chart. And we were below state average in 2010, and we are far below state average in 2014. And we also didn't make any progress in between the, those years. So um, if we extrapolate that kind of that 72% data to our town. Norfolk has a population a little over 24,000 people. So if we use that percentage, we have almost 7,000 people in our town who do not have broadband internet access at home. We're below the state average, and I think that really demonstrates that there's a real need. 
obviously we are trying to address this need in other ways. We have a public computing center in the library. We have free Wi-Fi open 24 24/7. But um, obviously, we know that there are people that can't get here during our open hours or can't get here enough to get done what they need to get done. So we would say, yes, there is a need. And so then the next step is, does this need fit with our mission? Um, this is our mission statement for our library. And this certainly is not a webinar on mission statements. And there may be some very good critiques of our mission statement out there. Um, but here it is. The Norfolk Public Library provides innovative library services that give community members of all ages the means to fulfill their recreational interests, interact with others in the community, get information on a broad array of topics, access resources to help them learn to read and use information effectively, and continue to learn throughout their lives. So does improving the availability of broadband access meet these um, stated goals? And I would say absolutely. Every single one of those can be improved with better broadband access in the homes of our community members. So then we also wanted to look at, is anyone else in the community working on this? Is there a good partner for us out there? Is there uh, someone that we can just help supplement what they're doing and make their program stronger? And you know, there's all kinds of places you can look across the state and your community from local nonprofits that work in your community to those that provide assistance to low-income families um, we've also got state assistance programs for telephone and energy assistance, but none of these address internet access. Internet access, there's, there's some efforts to get it um, classified as a utility, and the FCC has made a little progress on that goal, but it's really not considered a utility, and so it does not get included in all of these programs. Um, so in our community, at least, we found that really no one else is is working on this in the way that we're trying to get better internet access to low-income families in their homes. Um, so that meant we were going to kind of be on our own and working on this on our own. So then we have to look at if we're going to try to do this on our own, do we have the resources? And resources always come down to time and money. And um, you know, for the money piece of it, we decided to, uh, we had a little seed money in our collection budget. We had some databases that came in under budget or we decided to discontinue because they weren't getting used. And so we thought we could use some of that as money to get this started. And as far as time, this isn't a hugely time consuming process once you get up and running, but there's definitely an investment in time of getting the whole program going. And then there is some time just keeping it maintained. And so not only do you have the time, but do you have the right people who have the right time, people that can help you get everything set up properly and then keep it maintained and keep it going well. Um, in our case, we did, and you're going to hear from those people now. I'm going to turn it over to Judy Hilkeman. She's our reference supervisor and um, systems assistant. I can get the slide to go. And she's going to talk a little bit more about some of the practicality, practicalities of it all. Thank you, Jessica. Um, after the initial call with Verizon and the decision was made to go ahead with the project, uh, we went ahead and purchased four Verizon hotspots. And then it fell to our group of three to come up with uh, workable policies uh, that would fit with this, this new item. And so uh, one of the things that Director Jessica Chamberlain did was to contact Laura Marlane at uh, Omaha Public Library. She's the new director. But in her library at Rhode Island, they had circulated the hot spots. And so uh, she directed J uh, Jessica to a link that had the policies and the procedures that they used. And this is always a good idea for any library when you're starting something new is that to seek out people who have done this before and oftentimes, especially in the library world, they're more than willing to share their information and uh, you can get some excellent ideas. You don't have to reinvent the wheel um, with policies. So the main policies for the hotspot checkouts were as follows. Of course, uh, the obvious is everybody must have a Norfolk Public Library card to check out the item. 
because of the cost of the item and the investment of time and the fact that it was a technology item, we decided that uh, the people who check these out should be 18 years old or older. And probably what entered into our decision with that too was the fact that there are procedures and policies to follow uh, on the internet and so uh, we decided that 18 years of age or older uh, they should be responsible adults. <clears throat> Another item was that people should not have unpaid fees on their account. We do allow staff to use their discretion if the fees are small, like if somebody has a 25 cent fine, a 10 cent fine, there's no real good reason to deny them access to the item for such a small amount. But what we were more concerned about were uh, fees that were dollars or uh, materials that had not been returned and not paid for. And of course, uh, on this type of item, we wanted the person to have a borrowing history with, a, with us at least four months. Judy, we have a question from somewhere out in the state, and the individual is asking, do you have debit collection service for your library fines or unreturned items? Do you use a service for that? Uh, they are uh, able to pay their fines with a credit card or a debit card. Is that? Are you asking if we use a collection service? Yes, the question was if you use a collection service. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, we do not. Thank you. Did you elaborate on that? Uh, uh, Hotspots can currently be checked out for three weeks and cannot be renewed. Uh, as we put this process in motion, uh, we're kind of discussing that perhaps we may change this loan period, um, but we're still, that's still in the, the discussion uh, stage. Finally, uh, part of the policy is it must be returned to the library by the due date with all cables and original packaging intact. If it doesn't come back to us that way, uh, it's the same procedure that we use with our CDs and DVDs and video games. Uh, we do not check the item in until everything is back and intact. While it's going on, if it's not checked in, the fees continue to accumulate at $5 a day and then they max out at uh, $25 on this particular item. Uh, Overdue notices are sent out two days after the item becomes due. And then another thing that we introduced into uh, this procedure is we did put a home location on the item of IT desk uh, so that once it's checked in, the staff knows to, to give it to Mike, who is our uh, technology specialist, so that he can do what he needs to do to get the item ready for checkout again. And at that point, a notice goes out, yeah, either email or, or print. Uh, soon we're going to be able to text people also, but that the hotspot is ready for them. And they can pick it up at the circulation desk. And then finally, uh, in the background of all of this, uh, you did, we did need to set up some configuration changes in our ILS setup. And the first step that I did was I created an item type and item category of hotspot so that the catalogers could, uh, could catalog the item accordingly. We used to only have a 7-day and a 14-day loan period, and so this was new territory. We needed to create a 21-day loan period. And of course, as mentioned earlier, we had a uh, different billing structure for this item because of the cost of the item and the amount of uh, labor invested in it. And that would be, of course, like I said, $5 a day with maxing out at 25 And then it was also set up that uh, 
there could only be one checkout per library card and that they could not renew the item. Judy, we have another question, if you don't mind. It's just a quick one about what is the process to get the item ready to circulate again? Okay, I'm probably going to defer to Mike, and he will be covering that in his uh, presentation. Thank He's you. He's the guy who does that and who knows the most about that. And finally, to check the items out, we put we put the item out of the circulation desk, and uh, then we also ask our staff to do a few quick checks before the item goes out, and they need to verify the patron's address, their phone number, that they're at least 18 years old, and that they have had their card with us for four months. And this information uh, for us is readily available at the checkout screen under user information, and I'm sure under most uh, operating systems that, that uh, information is, is available rather quickly. Then we have the staff initial that they have done those checks, and they hand the customer an agreement to sign. Uh, ideally, the customer will read this and sign it, and then we do give this to Mike, and he keeps that on file. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then once they check out the item, they're given an information packet that includes uh, the agreement that they just signed. And then, of course, when the hotspots are all circulated and there's none available, staff is instructed to place holds on the, the six hotspots that we do have. So finally then, when we're checking these items back in, we prefer to have the original packing with barcode. Uh, if everything isn't there, staff should not check them in, and they should be given back to the patron to retrieve all the pieces. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a procedure that we use with DVDs and CDs and video games, so it's not a new process to our customers. Now I will turn over the, the mic to Mike Dittmer, and he'll talk to you about the techno, technical side of the hotspots and the packaging challenges and getting the hotspots ready for checkout. Hi, um, this is Mike. I just I'm gonna start by going over um, first the packaging. Um, we had oops. Okay. There's some screenshots on here on the screen that about that. Basically, you know, there wasn't anything. You know, when they come, they come in a little box, and that's not something that's gonna be able to be circulated very well in the last. So we actually were able to go down to Hobby Lobby and find um, some basic, basic little plastic tote. Um, and actually, when they had um, foam that would fit in there, uh, we cut a piece of two-inch foam and a piece of one-inch foam. As you can see, there's cutouts there that they could put everything back into. Um, kind of the reason we did it this way was we wanted to look like it was something that was very expensive and you know needed to be treated well. Um, Verizon it costs a little of nothing to get these from Verizon, and they, they actually are pretty good. They said that if something was destroyed or lost, they could cancel the cancel the line and then uh, set us up with another one without any charge. So it, it it looks expensive, and that's kind of what we wanted to get at, but we didn't want it to, you know. But it's not. Um, part of the packaging is what we handed out is as what um, Judy was saying is we have a pack or have a packet of information to hand out to them. Um, we did a little research, and one of the things is if they're doing streaming Netflix or Hulu or YouTube, they would blow through the initial, what we had told them, five gig of data in a, in a fairly short time. In most cases, they could have done it easily in a day. So we uh, added some links to some of the popular video sites and showed them how to turn the streaming quality down so that they would get more use out of it. Um, also, part of that packet is showed how to get to the uh, the SSID, which is the network name of the of the hotspot and the password, and how to get the password for it. We don't hard code that in any of the stuff that we give out because um, I do have that set differently on each one. So, um, and if we need to change it, which I think is probably a good um, 
good practice to occasionally rotate those passwords so that you know if someone does get in proximity to one that they've you know like a neighbor has checked it out, they're not swiping any of the Wi-Fi that's available on there and using any of their data. So the uh, the SSID, the network name, and the password are just available on the on the hotspot just by hitting the uh, powering it on and hitting the home button and scrolling down, you will find the name of it. Um, after that, um, one of the things I after that um, one of the few things I did was to set up and get ready to go out was to uh, again I said change the SSID and password, the network name and password. I had set them up as like you know Norfolk hotspot and then number just so we could kind of keep track of them as they came through to us to um, change the admin password and just for um, simplicity's sake, I kept the admin password the same on all of the units, so we didn't have to look up each individual one on that. Um, Mike, we, excuse yes. me, Mike, we have a question for you now. Um, the person is asking, did I understand right that there is a bandwidth cap per checkout? Um, it's not per checkout per se, but they do um, have a bandwidth cap. It's, it's, it's marketed as unlimited data. And when we first started doing this, they said that each one would get five gig of data that's unlimited or that's that's not limited in in, in download and bandwidth and capability. So like 20 gig per second or 20 gig, is what we're talking about. But um, they came back actually later on and said that they are actually not actively throttling the data rate until we get around 25 gig. And that's something I'm actually talk about a little bit later is how that kind of fit into how we wanted to do the um, the checkout period and things like that, but um, it, it's per month, and so we we that's kind of some of the intricacies of what we've worked with, and that's something I'm gonna talk to you about a little bit later. So I'll go in on that. So it is it, it was originally we tell them five just so we can make sure we guarantee to give them you know that that much amount of full speed data, um, but. It's kind of it's kind of a little bit different. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. So, thank you. Okay. Um, so one of the nice things about these particular Verizon uh, jetpacks is that they do allow you to hide the admin password, which is normally displayed on there, which is great if it's just your personal jetpack. But if you're handing it out to the public, you don't want that available, so they can make chat make exchange settings in there. So. I, I, it's one of the things I did was I set the admin password so it's off so they can't see it. And there's actually a setting that allows you to switch off the little um, little um, reset switch that's underneath the battery in the device, which would allow you to undo all the settings that we've made there. So with turning off that um, the display of the pa of the admin password and disabling that button makes them fairly resilient to changes. So um, People can't mess around with settings in there, so um, that's a couple things. Also, unchecked. There's a because there basically are a, a cell phone in a in, in sense. They actually can receive text messages, and so I actually did um, make it so you could uncheck text mess or uncheck messages, so that some of the odd spam text messages that everyone gets don't show up on the display and confuse patrons. Um, Well, actually, that's that is all done. Each each particular jetpack has its own little website, which is what you configure them through. So I have a laptop I configured to the website of each each individual jetpack um, that has that has, and then you can make these settings in there. Um, there is a portal that I'll get into a bit later on Verizon's that allow me to do some other things. So. Um, one thing I do too is I make the uh, SSID passwords. I make them all lowercase. They don't really have to be that complex, since in general they're not protecting any any personal data like you would have at your home. So I want it to be fairly easy for people to not have to call in and say I'm typing in this password, but I let me connect because they're not typing in as as uppercase or lowercase case sensitive. So um, another thing added on there is um, because of the fact that we can actually get to Verizon's website and disable these if they're not returned, I've added the uh, a 
put the four last four digits of the, uh, of the cell phone number that each one has um, in our library um, system so that I can go back and if I find one that's overdue, I can grab that number and make sure I'm turning off the correct um, hotspot. Um, as far as the data goes, now I'm getting the, to the kind of the circulation, and that was what when we had originally. Is that another slide? Uh, when I had uh, written, we had originally decided we were going to go to three weeks. Um, we kind of did that because the, each one of these hotspots is on a, a month cycle. Um, they all renew on the same day every month, so ours in this particular case renew on the 10th every month. So um, we had decided to go with the three-week cycle, so we could have they could have three weeks of having it. We would have a week, roughly, or sometime, or hopefully around a week at most, to be able to um, check them back in, see what we had for data left on them, and get them ready for the next patron. Um, that actually we found out that doesn't work well, and maybe it was me that didn't realize that. But with holds and you know when people pick things up, we've kind of figured out you're never going to be able to stay on that month. You know, try to get on the exact month of, of handing them out in the tenth and then getting them back. So that is one of the reasons why we were thinking about maybe we will reduce the loan period maybe to two weeks because. It's just we're never going to be able to keep it on that date. So that was kind of one of the intricacies we didn't foresee when we started this. Um, like I mentioned a little earlier to that question, we tell all of our patrons that there's five gig of, of data that's not throttled at full speed. Um, we learned after the fact that our, our reps said that, well, actually they go to around 25 gig before they start throttling them. Um, so. What we kind of tell patrons is we, you know, ever all the all the documentation um, says five. We've had some patrons call and say, "Hey, I've, I've, I'm I'm up to almost up to five gig. Am I going to be charged if I go over that?" And we just tell them, "No." We said that's just the, that's what Verizon has said that they are going to do. They're going to give five gig of full speed. And so I said, sometime after that, they will they will start throttling you down, and it'll be harder to watch Netflix or things like that. Um, so I guess they don't, we don't in general tell them, oh yeah, go to 25 gig because if there is some data left, then we can turn the devices around a little faster when we get them back. Um, after that, with with get into Verizon has a nice little portal that you see you get once you sign up for these uh, devices. It allows you to monitor and see what each device has used for data in the period. Um, one of the nicest things about it is if the device is um, if it is overdue, if it hasn't been returned on the, on the day it's supposed to be back, we can actually go in there and disable the device. Um, it's actually called, a, well, the, the setting in there is called pause with billing, um, in that case for the Verizon, and that basically turns the data off. It's like if you were going on vacation and we're going to use it. Um, so it turns the data off, which does make it come in a little bit faster than when they can't use it anymore. Um, also, if we do happen to have a device that is that is lost or stolen, you can mark it there as lost or stolen in the in the website, and that allows it so that you know whatever happened, whoever happened to, to get away with it, or if it was truly lost, then it can't be used anymore because Verizon has marked it and they can't activate it ever again. Um, so then after that, we go to check in, and I know um, Judy had already mentioned that. Um, when it comes in the door, we have staff verify that all the pieces are there. There's the hotspot, the charging brick, and the cable, um, plus the packaging. We want to make sure that's all there. Um, if that is there, then we want them to actually, our, our librarians, to actually just take them and put them on my desk um, for a couple reasons. Uh, with holds going, if we do have the if we do have the desk personnel check them in right away and they get set on my desk and I'm not there. We would have the whole go to vacation generated, and if it was done via email or text, it would go out and be available before I maybe had a chance to inspect the device, make sure no, no settings were changed, and make sure that the actual device was ready to go out as far as data wise. Because we might have a an issue where they have used all the full speed data, and they might and the the next patron might spend the most of the vast majority of their three weeks. 
that they have the device on throttle data, and we don't want that to happen. So that's one of the deals. If we get one back that is going to be limited in, in a data capacity through the, the majority of the time that the next patron have it, we're just going to hold on to it until it renews again. Um, Mike, we have another question. Um, the person's asking, did you say that you have them ready for checkout by the 10th of each month? Well, that was our original plan, which is why we kind of went with the three-week checkout period, because we had thought or hoped we could keep them on the same, you know, checking them in and out on the uh, same on the same frequency as they renew. We found with just the limited time we've done it that it's just that's not going to work very well, or we haven't been able to make it work that way. So we uh, we just I just basically make sure that when I get it in. That, that if I if it's going to go back out to a to a patron, that there's at least they have at least five gig left of, of the full speed data, um, and then if that's the case, then I will actually you know check it in, which generate the hold you know notification to go out. And since a lot of our holds are done right now, we don't have a ton of them on text or email yet. They're usually you know paper or physical mail. I usually actually call the patron just because we have it's, it's been a very very well received program and we have a ton of holds and so I'd like to keep these things moving so I don't want to wait the two to three days that it could be if we were relying on you know U.S. Postal Mail to get the get the uh, um, get the notification out to the patron and get them come in so we could be waiting three or four days if that was the case so. That's kind of how that works. It's just, and we're still kind of, you know, we're still kind of fluid with that whole setup and how we're doing it because we're we've still trying to figure out. I'm looking at every device as it comes in and seeing what the average of data is left and how it's working. Um, so we're we're still kind of trying to, um, we're still looking at that whole aspect of our checkout period and how that works. Um, Thank you. So after that, yeah, I said verify that there's, you know, there's going to be at least the five gig of data that we promised to them left, and then if that's the case, then I will um, check it in. Um, actually, what we do is when when I get it, I check it in and I check it right back out to a dummy account, so that the hold doesn't go out. So if I do have to keep it, you know, if I do have to hold on to it for a little while, we don't have to worry about the patron had before getting any notices or getting any charges on their account. Is set on the dummy account, and then when it is ready to go, I'll check it back in from that dummy account to generate the hold again and get ready to go. So that's all I have as far as the packaging. So we'll get it back to Jessica. Okay, so we wanted to share a little bit about how it's going for us so far. We just started in mid-August, so it's only been a few months that we've been doing this, and. Um, as Mike said, it's still, you know, we don't etch our policies on tablets. They're, they're changeable and adaptable as we see how things go for us. Um, but some of the things that we did, obviously, we wanted people to know that we were doing this. So there's kind of a sample of some flyers that we put up um, to try to get people's attention about this new program. We did put um, paper flyers by our library computers. Uh, thinking that those are going to be folks who probably don't have internet access at home and might be interested in this program. And actually, they were some of our first users of the program, or people who were using our public computers saw the poster and came to the CERC desk and said, we just saw this, you know, how can we do this? Um, we also had a press release to our local media, like we do for all new programs and services. Um, but this was particularly well received. The local media really thought this was an exciting thing, and so we got coverage on local and regional radio and TV, and also in our local newspaper. So um, we had a news channel from Sioux City call us, and I've been here for four years, and that's the first time they ever wanted to do any kind of story on what our library was doing. So. That was exciting to see that the community really embraced it and um, our media really helped us publicize the program. Uh, we did also have someone at the public school send an email out to all the students and teachers so that they were aware um, of this program, which I thought was wonderful. Our high school kids and junior high kids all get one-on-one -on -one technology in school. They get either iPad minis or Chromebooks at school. 
but we know that not all of them have internet access at home to do their homework on them. So that was another great um, publicity opportunity for us. This was part of our um, first press release uh, and just gives a nice uh, example of exactly why we wanted to start this program. This is Barbara and her son Logan. Um, and her quote was, as a single mom, I can't afford to pay for the internet. Logan has a Chromebook from school, so now he can log on to the internet at home and do his schoolwork. Um, you know, we have, we make no judgments about what people are doing on the hotspots. We obviously, if they're watching Netflix or using them to connect to Facebook, that's certainly fine. But um, this is just such a great example of the good that they can do in our community and the good that they can do for individual families helping kids get their homework done. Another kind of neat public reaction we had was we had um, someone write us a letter and donate their Wi-Fi hotspot that they had personally purchased a few years ago. Um, they hadn't had um, service on it in a while, and so they wanted to donate it to us so that we could use it in our program and help get the internet out to other families. And I just thought that was a really touching example of how the community was embracing it. And as Mike mentioned, there are lots of holes. This is a screenshot from our ILS. Uh, you can see the six hotspots there. They're all checked out. And then there are uh, 27 holds on them currently. So another part of our adapting this program is that we're considering getting a few more and maybe even adding to the six that we already have. We have another question, if you don't mind. Uh, Not at all. This person says, could you tell us more about the partnership program with Verizon? What is it called and do you pay a monthly fee? Sure. Um, I'll switch to this resources slide. There at the bottom, you can see our contact at Verizon. Uh, we've been working with Abby Pasco, who is the government and nonprofit account manager. Uh, she is happy for you to reach out to her. She covers our territory um, in Nebraska. I, um, I don't know how big her region is, but you certainly can get in touch with her and she can direct you to who your regional rep would be. Um, they do provide us with a program where we receive the hotspots at no charge for the hotspot itself, and then we do pay a connection fee per device per month. So, but that is at a discounted rate than what you would get if you just went into you know, a normal store and they, they work with us on making sure that we're not paying tax and that, as Mike mentioned, you know, if a patron loses a hotspot or it gets lost um, or broken, that we don't get charged for that. We can cancel that line of service with no early termination fee and, and start a new line on a new hotspot. So there is, it's definitely not a free program, um, but it's one that's at a much lower cost than what we would be able to do without this kind of partnership. Um, the resources that I listed there are just some other libraries. Obviously, we are not the only people doing this. There are lots of other libraries across the country who are starting programs like this. And I just put some links on there. Um, these are libraries that had some interesting information on their websites. They had their policies and circulation rules kind of all out there on their website. And thought that might be interesting for people who are considering doing this to take a look at what some other places are doing. Um, you know, our current checkout time is three weeks, but that checkout time varies in these libraries anywhere from seven days up to six months. So there's a huge range of options when you consider how you might want to make this work for your com particular community and, and what you think will work for you. We have a couple of follow-up questions to the last one. One is, um, so you're saying there is no monthly data fee, just a connection fee. So it's a monthly data fee. A monthly data data fee, okay. Right. It's just like it's I mean connection to your data fee, however you say oh. you pay a monthly fee per device. Right. And another person asks, does cell service have to be available for the hotspot to be used? I would say yes. <laughs> um, and Verizon does have really good coverage in Nebraska. Um, but there is obviously little pockets um, of the state that, you know, may not have cell service. Um, so, yeah, it will work anywhere that you can get a cell signal on your phone. But if you can't get a cell signal there, it, the hotspot won't work. And one more question. Could you tell us generally how expensive this is? 
Um, I understand it might not be the same in my own area, but what fee is it that you need to pay? Um, the, the fee that we pay is $40 per device per month. Um, but I, like you said, I don't know if that is different based on population served or, um, you know, different kinds of agreements that Verizon would have with different communities. That's, that's what we are paying right now. Thank you. And there might be other, you know, in some places I know there are some smaller towns that Verizon does not have. I, I can't quite hear you. Is that Mike? Yes. Oh, um, and there probably are, and there are other places probably you can go through than, than Verizon. I know there are some small towns around that do not have, um, Verizon doesn't have a tower next to them, so they don't have very good service there. Um, there are some in northeast Nebraska that, you know, with, as Verizon works, you know, my cell phone's dead, but they have like Vero or US Cellular, so, and they all have hotspots, probably just a different program than what Verizon has, but that's something to, to take into effect if you are Doing this in a small town that you know, and you don't have, you know, most people in there don't have Verizon as their phone provider. You're probably not going to get the best service. You might want to look at some place, some other different carrier. Thank you. We have a request that you go back to the resources page for a minute. I think they were jotting something down. Thank you. Sure. And we'll send Krista all these links, and also we'll send um, our checkout packet you know we have a packet that we gave to our staff when we were first um, all trying to learn about how this was going to work for us so we have a information packet for staff and then we also have a packet of information that we hand out to everyone with their when they check out um, that includes that checkout agreement that they just signed which basically just states the policies and the due dates and the late fees and things like that um, but then we also give them a list of um, commonly um, done things on the internet and how much data that uses so that they're aware of how fast they could go through that data. Um, and then the last page is uh, kind of an info sheet on how the hotspot works and it just kind of is directions on how to turn it on, where you find the password, things like that. And, and we will share all of that as well with, for anyone that would like it. Thank you. And I would like to remind people that all of this presentation will be online and the resources that you have listed here, the, the um, URLs will be included so that you can access this after the program. It'll be a little while because Krista's not here right now. I forgot to tell you that I'm Sally Snyder. Maybe you know that, but I doubt it. Anyway, I was so excited we were having a little trouble. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your presentation. Go on. Oh, no, I, I think that's it. Um... Are there other questions out there that folks would like to ask? Well, I'm looking at our question page right now, and I'll give them a minute to to type something in. In the meantime, I'd like to say thank you very much, Jessica and Judy and Mike, for giving this presentation. It's really fascinating, and I I'm just I think it's a tremendous service to your community, and I really want to buy you some more of those things, but I don't have the funding right now. <laughs> well, thank you for that. We, we do accept donations anytime. <laughs> Another person says, we have just started doing this. This was an excellent presentation. Thanks so much for all the information. I look forward to the recorded session because they got called away. And another person asks, does this program fall under E-rate reimbursement? That's a good question. And Chris is not here today. Yeah, that would be a great question. Um, internet access is certainly covered. Um, that I would I would definitely pose that question to Krista. That is a good idea. Well, thank you again for presenting this to the the people in Nebraska and other parts of the country. We really appreciate your sharing your experience so far and for just two months and 27 holds. Wow. That's tremendous. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you letting us share this. And our contact information is there if anybody wants to follow up with us personally. Um, we certainly would, would be happy to help anyone get started or answer questions that we could. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to encourage people to tune in next week for Encompass Live. I wasn't forward thinking enough to find out what the topic is next week. But all you have to do is go to our webpage and look it up, and you can find that out. 
Um, oh, Allison's going to look it up for me right away. We really appreciate people tuning in. You are, we're every Wednesday from 10 o'clock till 11 or so, depending on how long the presentation is. And uh, there's only a couple days a year we don't broadcast. Um, that's during conference, which is next week, it's right? It's next week. So this is Allison. So next week there won't be an Encompass Live because uh, a lot of us will be going to the yearly conference in Omaha and doing the pre-conference activities. So we'll see you guys all on October 26th for Comic-Con. Yeah. Oh, that sounds interesting. Organizing a successful comic slash maker con at your library. So that will be in two weeks from today. Next week we won't be here. And we really appreciate those who tuned in. And remember that this will be archived onto your um, our webpage so you can access it whenever you need to. If you just want to look back at something or if you want to grab one of the URLs, you can find it on our webpage. And we appreciate it. So thank you again, Jessica, Judy, and Mike. And thank you all for tuning in.